Okay, we are recording. So welcome folks. Um, thank you all for joining in on the All Coaches Briefing. Um, traditionally one of our um, big events early in the season. We had this planned um, obviously way, way, way back in time. Um, quite a few things have changed since then. So slightly uh, different program tonight, running this in Zoom. Hopefully everyone's familiar with the technology. Um, just for everyone's sake, if it's possible, make sure you've got your microphones on mute. Feel free to leave your cameras on so we can spot you. Um, Kelly's gonna be keeping track in the, the chat. So if everyone can like to do a chat, post a question, um, we can cover all those a bit later on, just to help keep the flow of the presentation going. Got a fair bit to cover tonight. Um, I'll run through the agenda. Um, so what we're looking at tonight, is a bit of an intro about what the season's going to look like, hopefully. Um, we'll have a bit of a chat about the club's structure. Um, we've got Dave Hannon from the YJFL umpires going to have a little chat about um, a few tweaks to some of the rules and a, a little bit about the umpires. Um, Kelly's going to jump on and, and go through what it takes to get started as a coach. We've actually got 18 um, brand new first time coaches uh, as lead coaches this year um, and then numerous uh, new assistant coaches so a really big crew um, to induct and then get up to speed with what we like to see um, you're probably aware there's lots going on at the league as well so we can run through some of that stuff um, we're going through some resources we've got Chris Connolly uh, is going to give us a chat about the advanced coach mentoring online tool um, so that's something we've all got access to and it's really, really important that we understand the benefits of using that. Um, the club invests pretty heavily in coaching and this is one tool that we think is really important for all coaches to get the hang of and, and really get the best out of. Um, Tim's going to talk about code of conduct and cultural framework. Um, Kirsten's going to have a bit of a chat about player safety, wellbeing um, and concussion management and, and a few updates regarding some COVID protocols uh, on the back of our presentation last week. Um, and I'll just chat about um, facilities and, and then grounds at the end of the end of the session. So hopefully we won't um, keep you guys here all night long. We'll try and get through this as swiftly as possible, um, but it's probably time we get underway. So um, I guess from my point of view, um, this has been a really, really strange time uh, for footy, obviously. Um, you, you get into a bit of a, a groove and a rhythm of what the season looks like and how things flow and timelines happen at certain checkpoints. And this has really tipped us all upside down. Um, there's been stuff that we can work on in the background, which is quite productive, but obviously the focus is just getting kids on the, on the park out to play some footy. Um, you've probably seen the YJFL has been quite active in the media. Um, don't need to go over that, but um, they're, they're forging ahead with a plan. Um, dates have been set um, in theory. It's all sort of dependent on what the govern, uh, government regulations state at the time when that happens. So we'll cover those dates a bit later on. Um, our focus is obviously our members, our kids, our families and and the safety and well-being of them so until we can be satisfied that all those bases are covered um, we're going slowly we're taking our time um, we're at a place now where we can get started which is fantastic um, we've got our training grid finalized today um, we'll elaborate on that a bit later on but if you all want to pencil in your diaries uh, Sunday 14th of June um, that's going to be launch day. Um, lots of information to dump on you tonight. So we will skim over a couple of slides relatively quickly, but obviously we're going to deliver this as a, a video pack if you want to watch it. Obviously, who wouldn't? Um, but we can have the, the PowerPoint deck for everyone if they wanted to check back on something that isn't quite clear tonight. Um, so with a number of teams and players that we've got, um, we're looking at our we were looking at our record number uh, in March, we were sitting at about uh, 31 teams, I think it was, and about 680 kids. So given that we hadn't really finished that uh, late phase of registration, you know, we were heading towards the 700 mark, which would have been 
an incredible feat. Hopefully, most of the kids who have registered do stay on and play if we get playing. Um, so coaching, obviously, it's, it's particularly challenging. Um, it's even harder if you're a coach and you haven't got a team to coach and you haven't got footy. So thank you all for firstly putting your hands up. Um, it's a really tough gig. And we like to make sure that our coaches um, are the best prepared in the competition. And I think we do a really good job at doing that. Um, the one thing, obviously, we need to consider that, you know, footy is about far more than just football and the community is our focus and reconnecting with our teams and our kids and our members now is a really important stage. So if you haven't done so yet, um, you really need to make sure you're reaching out to your teams and touching base. Obviously with training uh, happening in a couple of weeks or just under, you know, under two weeks, um, we want to make sure that everyone's as ready as they can be. So a couple of other things. Um, with Ben, uh, Ben Harrison, obviously a new president. Um, he's been doing a, a great job of uh, dealing with the league, uh, dealing with other clubs. And while some other clubs have already commenced training, um, they reside in different councils. They've got different protocols that they've had to follow that maybe haven't been as strict as what City of Yarra's has been. Um, Ben's um, daily talking to other other presidents in the in the league and. And they're all in the same mindset that the main thing we want to do is get kids out and train if we can. Playing will be fantastic. And if and when that happens, um, you know, we'll all be ready to go. Okay, so with our coaching crew this year, um, have a quick look at the screen. Um, we've got, as I said, uh, in bold highlighted with a little asterisk there, they're our brand new coaches, uh, 31 teams, plenty of new faces on the, on the grid. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, some have been around the club for a while and are now just getting their head around what being a coach is all about. Um, so anytime anyone's got any questions, um, talk to your coach, Dev Reps, talk to Kelly and myself and we can help you out. So within our club, um, we've got a quite a unique structure with the Coach Dev subcommittee. Um, this is something that we've introduced a number of years ago and it really sets us apart from every other club. We've got a, enough quality people who have had lots of experience, who know the ropes, who have jumped into these roles. Um, sometimes they even volunteer for it, but not often. They get asked and uh, it's, a, it's a very significant role, particularly for our coaches, and you'll get great value from dealing with your coach dev reps as the season hopefully unfolds for us. Um, I won't run through them all, but uh, if you have a look at the sheet there. You should all now, by now, know who your coach dev rep is um, and keep constant contact with them. Anytime you need something, that's your first port of call um, and then they'll be able to hopefully figure out what you need. Uh, with our club, obviously, it's a pretty large club. Um, the, the committee does a great job. Things that you probably don't realise that they do um, get taken care of. We're currently running weekly meetings as that's that much information to go through and process and and make decisions on and, and sort out so it's not just hey matty you got a you got a screen to share mate uh, is that not sharing for you dale no nah. is it sharing for everybody else is it yeah i can see it yep all okay. good uh, yep. Sure. good yep all good keep going mate don't worry no worries Dale. we'll, we'll, we'll be sharing this uh presentation later on uh what just as a quickie, just to get that done. Are you on a computer or a, or a portable, like a phone or a laptop? Or I'm on an iPad, mate. Okay, so there might be a button you can just touch and, and go on to the view mode and change it to a different view. So try that. Well, yeah, don't, don't worry, mate. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and work it out. It's fine. No worries. We'll push on. Um, so with our committee, um, obviously Ben is our new president. Um, somehow I got tricked into becoming vice president as well as coaching director. Craig Dowling, secretary. Crofty as a treasurer, Inga on footy ops, uh, Sophie Gammons on girls dev, Tim McHugh's jumped into the conduct role, um, Kirsten's inherited um, a very big portfolio as it's turned out to be in safety, wellbeing and now COVID um, officer. Um, Esther unfortunately has to step down for community. We've got on brand Peter King and we've got Glenn on infrastructure. 
And then there's a number of subcommittees. So taking care of the admin, we've got Louise who attends all of our community meetings and helps us with our admin tasks. Um, Kelly's jumping, jumping all over the place as coaching coordinator. Um, John Armstrong, he's been working tirelessly on grounds um, as well as going to coach again this year. Mel Grant on first day. John Daniluk, stalwart of the club um, as our child safety officer. Linda on Rego, Jenny, my partner on accounts, counting the beans. Um, Jan on events, Michael Canazé is our enterprise coordinator and Dean Robertson on as a webmaster. So as you can see, a really extensive list of people there um, who take care of us um, and you guys during the season. Um, so that's the background of what the club's all about. Um, nothing happens by chance. It's all really well planned and I think you could all rest assured that you know, you've got the, the best committee in junior football. So moving on to the, um, one of our first guest speakers, um, I'm going to introduce in a second Dave Hannon. So Dave uh, has been around the league for a number of years. He, he takes care of all of the umpiring for, for the whole competition, um, responsible for getting all the young umpires into umpiring, teaching them the game, the training, uh, allocation to, to games and, and management of them during the, during the week. Um, Dave's a great guy. You'll love to stay friends with him. Um, the last thing I like to do is get a call from Dave on a Sunday night uh, after a game because that generally means bad news. But uh, in this format, Dave's a very, very lovely guy. And if you wouldn't mind, Dave, just um, popping your video on and welcome to Fitzroy Coaching Crew. Thanks for the um, <clears throat> kind words. Uh, yeah, basically, um, yeah, it's been it's been a challenging few months as we've all had. So basically, what happened is we were having our record year for the amount of umpires we had enrolled, um, and so we've had to reassess obviously everything we're doing. But we've been communicating to umpires, um, and we've had a, quite a few different meetings with them and all that. So moving forward, we still have lots of numbers, and I think we're going to get more with numbers coming through with some of the senior competition looks like they're not going to run or well, there are the northern and the um and the eastern so we're going to endeavor to start training in the next couple of weeks um however we're going to limit that to only first and second year umpires at this stage uh, for the obvious reasons we've been getting really good numbers of training so we run quite a few different venues we run down at bullion park on a wednesday um, and then we run out at um, camwell this year on a thursday so two different venues and we have a couple of satellite ones out at um, Park Orchards and also St Mary's. That was the last year and we're going to do one at Park Orchards. And then we have a couple of school ones that we run at Canberra Grammar um, as well. So they're obviously everything stopped. So what we're going to do is we're going to start up and we, we have to limit it to hopefully by then it's about 50 kids. Now, usually we're getting you know, 70 to 80 at training. So some guys have been around for a long time, other umpires there. So you know, the rules haven't changed too much. You know, there's not a great deal of changes apart from a couple of the, you know, the COVID-19 rules that will be implemented, which will be up to probably coaches and umpires to implement then on game day. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly excited that we're going to start the season. I think it's what we all want. Um, but, you know, it's going to be different. It is going to be different at games. So I think we have to do that. And I think probably this year, especially when we've got first and second year umpires, or maybe first, are just coming back into it and maybe you're not going to get exactly what they've had in the past, I think we probably have, a, have to have a bit more patience than we've had in the past. But I think our numbers will be really good. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm really excited for the, um, hopefully in the next month that we do start on the 12th of July. But we'll be up and running. Um, you know, we're going to make it a bit shorter training. We're going to, you know, do it. We usually go from six to about quarter past half past seven, we're just going to do one hour. You know, when we go to training, we don't tell the kids to run 50 laps and run, run, run like we used to do seven, eight years ago when I started doing the role. I found that what we were doing, we were, you know, we were getting there at training at six, we'd run to 10 past seven, and then we'd say, oh yeah, just do a couple of drills, that's in the back, that's around the neck, and then we'd go and that'd be it. Well, now we get there, we do 10 minutes, probably a 10 minute warm up, and then we try and show them some rules. Um, and show, show them how to umpire, and we stimulate games, and we break it down to first, second, and, and you know, third year umpire. So, and I think that's better that we just we're not there. The kids don't want to come to training, 
and do laps and do that. They want to come and learn how to umpire. And I've, I've recognised that over the years. So, you know, it's just not me who run it. You know, I have some really good helpers. Um, there's quite a big group of us now. You know, I would have, you know, eight to 12 people at my disposal um, helping out um, on game day and at training and all that. But, you know, I do coordinate it um, with, you know, good help by John Taylor. Um, it was probably on my side of it and then quite a few other coaches. So, you know, I, you might have seen me. I still get out and do games, um, you know, occasionally. Um, my favourite ground is probably, and I'm, this is not biased at all, it's probably Alfred Crescent because it's the smallest ground in the competition. It's really good because you can just stand around and um, be there. But I like doing under 13s, I have to admit. I, I sort of do that. And I'll just mentor kids. So we'll put someone like, you know, one of the coaches and we'll go off and do a two-arm play system. I think last year and the year before, I think probably last year was the best year I've sort of certainly been involved in with umpiring and just games and how many we had. And a lot of the games we had two umpires. And I think that is really important. We do have two umpires um, in a lot of the games. And then, you know, we just try and teach umpires to get side on our content and that's why you, you'll get there. So, no, I don't think things will change too much, but, um, yeah, I'm certainly, um, yeah, I'm excited that, we're going to be up and running um, sooner than later. Great stuff, but, Dave. Yeah, but I'm open for any questions. Anyone wants to ask me anything, you know, you just go by Drew. You're not, you know, but, you know, we just got to make sure, I probably, you know, over time, I've sort of said, oh, you know, if an umpire misses a free kick, you know, he missed one around the neck or he did that. I mean, we've got to look at the big picture. Um, but, you know, certainly if it's, if you think it warrants it, you talk to Drew and I'm, sort of, I'm sure Drew or anyone else there or, or Mark, um, um, Michael, Michael Kennedy, you know, you've got different people at the club who you could run it by them if you're not happy with something. But, you know, I'm really approachable, email, you know, a phone call. Um, you know, it's, we're there to, to help you guys. Um, and, you know, umpires get paid. You guys don't get paid. You're all volunteer. I get paid in this role. So, you know, I'm, you know I always expect people to be accountable. And, um, and I think we are. So, Anyone, any, any time you, you think um, you, they're worried something, you always call. And I think that's what we've done in the last quite a few years. Thanks, Dave. Um, as you mentioned, um, we've got uh, Michael Canizé at our end, um, very experienced campaigner. He's coached at a number of age groups, has umpired for many, many years, and I think still gets out there and umpires, and a couple of his sons umpire also. Um, so he's generally our conduit through to David. So. If on a game day something causes you a few concerns and you like a chat, um, by the touch base with probably firstly with myself or Michael, and then and we can pass to Dave, and then you can connect with him if you want a bit more info. But as Dave said, very approachable. Um, he puts his photo on the website for the YJFL and his address and everything's there. So if you ever like to reach out to him, uh, please do. But yeah, just be mindful that um, you know. The umpires are mostly kids and they're all doing their best and they make mistakes like the rest of us. And um, if there's anything serious, we'll absolutely take care of it. And that includes uh, coaches who misbehave and anything that um, happens on the football ground that's uh, inappropriate, rest assured, Dave will know about it. Thank you, Dave, very much. You don't want any questions? You don't want to throw any questions? No one wants to no, any questions. Questions. If anyone's got any questions for Dave, please feel free to um, just jump in and, and ask them now. We'll give you a few minutes to get through some questions, if you like, Dave, before you scoot off. Yeah. Kelly, if you're just checking the chat room, maybe something's popping in the chat room. No, uh, chat room's all quiet. All quiet. Everyone's just busy. Right. Good stuff. Um, Matt, can, can uh, Dave uh, send around um, his email and uh, maybe a little bit of information about how, um, if you're interested in joining the umpiring fraternity, you might like to uh, make contact to do so? Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I, uh, that's great. That's how we actually got quite a few umpires a little while ago. Yep, we can do that. Um, I think um, there is a, uh, for the supplementary umpires, we were running a, um, a day on the 28th of June, which will probably go out the next day or two. Um, and that's just decided today, so it's hot off the press. And it's on a Sunday, um, and, but it is the start of school holidays, but it's two weeks out of the season. And that's for supplement drum pies. But, you know, we, we train on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, not at Pulling Park, um, six to probably seven o'clock. It's going to be a bit shorter than sweater. Um, and 
anyone's welcome to come. And you know, we welcome dads and mums, brothers and sisters. We welcome anyone to come. And we have a great intake from Fitzroy, and we've had some really good, um, you know, really good you know, boys and girls. It's been fantastic, and, and I know a lot of them are rejoining um, for, for this season as well. So, you know, but we're, we're always, you know, you can never have not enough umpires. I think, you know, I think, you know, we can say, oh, you know, we've got too many, but you know, if everyone just does. One, a lot of some kids do two games, but if you sort of cut them back to one, they'll do one game and run it out pretty well. So always open to the people coming down. Thanks, Dave. If you could flick that around, that'd be awesome. Will do. Cheers. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks, Dave. No worries. Bye. See ya. See ya. Rightio. So again, we've got a, a great pipeline to the league. Um, should we ever need to contact someone regarding anything to do with umpiring and, and rule interpretations and all those kind of things. So um, really important that we keep that relationship nice and solid and open. Rightio, so let's have a look at um, season overview and, and what we're looking for uh, from you guys this year. So it doesn't have to be games. Um, we need to understand why kids play footy. And the club's philosophy is pretty clear. Kids play footy because it's fun. Um, we aim to be a model club. We make sure that we do the right things as often as we can and minimise the times that we stuff up. Um, we always need to conduct ourselves well. Um, that's players, officials and parents. And we have to understand that it's not about sheep stations. The win is less important than the fun. It's just junior footy. Kids don't play footy because they want to play in the AFL. There might be the smallest percentage who are dreaming about it but most of the kids love playing footy because they like hanging out with their friends. Um, we've got lots and lots and lots of data. If you've been around the club for any period of time, you would have done the survey. So every parent and every player fills this in as best we can. Um, we get an amazing response on this and we do push it very hard. And the reason is because we want to know what everyone thinks. Good, bad and ugly, we take it all on board and we use it to, to shape the way that the club is. Um, the good thing is the, the trend hasn't really changed over the last half a dozen years. It's really consistent. Strong friendships um, is what drives the enjoyment factor, um, where the success of the team is, is generally the lowest, um, lowest thing that teams and players and parents um, seem to be concerned about. Um, and they're also focusing on retention. We just want to have kids coming back and playing again next year. Um, so on the retention side of things, we get roughly 90% of our kids nominated to come back and out of the ones that don't, there's various reasons, moving to a new location, top age players moving on, some just don't enjoy it, that's okay, we can't please everyone, but to have a retention rate of about 90% is pretty amazing and, and we make sure that happens by focusing on the important things and that's the fun, development and the friendship side of things. Oh, skipping here too far. So with our rego, um, this is kind of where we build our season from and, and the teams. I won't dwell on this too much, um, but this is where we sat as of about March. Um, Mid-March, we had 667 registered players. Same point previous year, we were about 20 or 30 ahead and forecasting for probably another 40 to 50 kids to turn up between that time and maybe around three or four when red joes, you know, generally dry up. So we're on target for our, our biggest membership base uh, so far by that stage of the year. So breakdown over the years, you can sort of see a fairly steady progression of growth when the orange section is the girls football kicked off. Um, the boys have traditionally stayed about the same. Um, but the growth in girls' footy has, has come along in leaps and bounds. We've sort of been over the 200 mark for the last couple of years. And again, hopefully, if um, we get up and running again, we might find a few more kids come back to footy, particularly kids who may have nominated school football as their sport or basketball. And we're not certain what those sports are going to do. So there might very well be another influx of registrations um, if there's a bit more certainty about the season kicking off. But um, we're at the point where we can't really take a hell of a lot more players on because we sort of tap out on 
facilities um, and and just you know pure human resources. It's really hard to find uh, 31 coaches and assistant coaches and team managers and first aiders and new COVID officers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not all about the win. Um, what we really aim for, and in a perfect world, we'd love to get a 50-50 ratio. And if you have a look at 2019, we ended up with 194 wins and 194 losses, which is, uh, I reckon, a pretty great achievement. Obviously, some teams are um, overrepresented in some of those sides of things. But what we do aim for during the journey of a player's uh, career through the club is have the ups and downs, the peaks and troughs, um, to experience what it's like to be in a winning side to know how tough it can be in a losing side, but you can still have fun and, and realise that's not the be and all and end all if you don't win the game. Um, we find that if teams are getting far too conditioned to winning every single game, then their interest is really waning. Um, they, they expect it all the time. Um, the approach is very, very different. So we do like to see that um, you know, up and down progression in the way a teams are tracking over the course of their journey. And we'll follow that and use that information to really support any moves we need to make when it comes to grading. Um, so if you think you've had a rough run for a couple of years, don't worry, we do know about it. And we're making every attempt to make sure that that will be uh, eased up a little bit down the line for you. So when it comes to grading, um, it's it's a really difficult job. Um, we don't get to nominate. We Sorry, we nominate, we don't get to choose. So we can suggest to the league what we think is the most appropriate grade for our teams. Um, but it's really up to the discretion of, of the league. And, and there's many, many factors that go into getting the grades done. It's really, really complicated. But um, I think in, in all accounts, we do it really openly and honestly with the league. So they do trust what our nominations are. And more often than not, the, the grades we nominate um, is where our teams land. So a little bit of a colour-coded system. I won't nut it out too much, but anything that's red is a bit of a highlight. We need to make sure that we can get a move on those teams. Orange is a watch and a green is something we need to be aware of as well. Um, sometimes it might be a, a team that's sitting at the top of the top grade and undefeated for a long time. Well, we need to look at ourselves and figure out if there's multiple teams in that grade. Perhaps we need to think about the distribution of players so that the second and even third team can have some support so those teams can also be competitive. There's no, no advantage in a team winning every single game. Um, if a team's at the bottom of the bottom of the grade, and I've been in that boat coaching a team in that situation before, um, you know, it's a tough road, but we've had most of our kids return year after year and they're quite happy just going to get something from the canteen at the end of the day and, and have some fun with their mates. So it just proves that the win isn't that that critical, but we do like to make sure we can even it out if we can. Uh, so this year is a season like no other. Um, we have to accept the new reality, reset your goals and manage expectations of not only the players, but the parents and make sure that everyone understands that um, the results are the least important thing. If games get going, um, we want to make sure that kids are having fun. Uh, very, very high on your list of priorities is to make sure that sick kids can't play or train. Um, if you notice a kid who's unwell and it's at training, we need to have a check and, and talk to your COVID rep on the night of training, talk to your team manager and talk to the parents and figure out what's going on. Um, there might be some medical conditions we're not aware of. There's asthmatics in the club, um, you know, other, other things come into play, but essentially the rules are very, very strict. If a kid is unwell, they cannot train or play. Um, and that also includes you as coaches. So if you're unwell, you can't be at training and need to make other arrangements. Uh, training drills, we've got a set of approved drills and focus on the skills and the fun. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail with the training app very soon with Chris. Um, the other one that's really important is only registered players are allowed to train. And that's essentially for our insurance. We have to have a registered player. Um, otherwise, they don't get covered by our policies and, and that can cause a whole lot of problems down the line. So if a kid turns up and wants to have a kick and a run around, they can't do it at our official training. They can go and have a kick with their friends and learn some skills, 
But if they want to train, they have to be paid up registered members. Um, you need to tell us how you're going to split your teams into groups of 20 to work with our training grid. Uh, if you've got more than 20 on your team, we'll come up with a plan. There will be some sort of rotation or a roster. I'd expect that you'd be very um, lucky to have every kid available at training anyway. But if you've got more than 20, we can discuss that a bit later on. Uh, once you've appointed your COVID safety rep, we'll be able to allocate your training time. So until you've got all those officials in place, you can't go on the training field. So it's now incumbent on you as coaches to reach out to your parents, um, find your COVID safety rep, and that will then be the trigger for us that you can get on the training track. And if you can have two coaches per 20 players, so again, if you haven't got assistant coaches lined up yet, now's the time to reach out to your family, families in your team, and, and you know get those coaches organised. We need to get them trained, accredited, and up to speed as well. Um, during training, coaches and players can't rotate in the same day. So if you have um, two halves of the ground, the coaches can't swap during the same session. At the following session, you can reset and start again and have different coaches in different sessions. But on the same night, players can't move and coaches can't move. They have to stay together. And also just check in with your players that aren't training. Um, there's going to be some that choose not to train for various reasons. So make sure you're just touching base with them, see how they're going. They might feel a little bit excluded and mum and dad might have a really legitimate reason why they're not training. But please make sure that they're being contacted and, and feeling part of the group. We've got some tools. We can use Zoom. We can use this format. Just let me know if you'd like to book it in and we can get a team Zoom catch up for yourself and your team going. Happy to do that anytime. So the approved drills, they live in a folder. Um, Kelly's done a great job of, of pulling out some of these drills. I think a few coaches have sent some through as well. Um, these have come from our coach mentoring tool, um, broken down into different categories. Keep your, keep your pairs. So just get kids to identify somebody they like to work with. And if they can stay with that, that player and that person throughout the duration of this current level, um, it really makes the tracking and tracing a lot easier and, and we really minimise the risk. So just try and encourage kids to find a buddy and that's their buddy throughout the duration of this, this period of training. Um, if you've got a drill that you've found that you know works and is a really good one, please let us know and we'll add that to our library as well. Um, and also the drills have to consider the player distancing, so make sure that they're not going to come into contact with each other. It's really important. Um, there's going to be people watching our training sessions, including the residents. And the last thing we need is to have any issues. Um, if if somebody does the wrong thing, there is significant significant fines, as you've already been made aware. And we don't want to have to deal with that sort of stuff. Um, your sessions are a little bit shorter than normal. Um, I think I've got it to work, so most of them are a, a decent sized chunk of time now. Um, but just make sure you keep the kids moving and minimise the breaks. Um, and a good training plan and be prepared in advance is absolutely essential. You can't turn up to training and just make it up on the spot. It's way too hard. So the dates. Um, we have 12 weeks until the 27th of September to get through a home and away matches. Um, the proposed start date from the league is as a Sunday, 12th of July, which would have been... Um, a normal round anyway. It's the last day before uh, school returns for the next term. Um, so all going well and restrictions are eased, we can then um, we can then have enough time to play a, a decent amount of games to you know constitute a season. Uh, grading will be three games. It may be two, but they're expecting it to be three games. So that will give the league a bit of time to, to shuffle around. There's potential that some clubs and some teams won't be able to continue as they'd originally planned. So we're going to have to resubmit all of our teams again. So we really do need you guys to confirm uh, with your teams what the numbers are looking like. If there's any people who aren't going to play for whatever reason, we need to know that really soon. Um, you know, everyone's doing their best to get the kids on the field. And if it's a 12-week season, um, the four-game qualification kicks in. So there's a little bit of room to, to wiggle and move around to get the teams balanced if we have to. We'd rather get it done beforehand if we can. So the more that you guys can help 
um, extract that information from your teams the better. A couple of small rule changes. Um, the minimum number to constitute a game for girls will be eight, uh, reduced from 11. Uh, for boys and mixed teams, it's going to be 10. So potentially you could be turning up to a game and have 20 available players, but your opposition as a boys team might only have 10. Um, there will be no even up rules this year for obvious reasons, um, but we have to factor that into, into calculations. So what we're going to try and do is open up a communication channel between clubs um, and then we can plan in advance as best we possibly can to shuffle players around at our end so we don't end up with those big mismatches. Uh, so we've got a few things that we're proposing to the league. Hopefully we'll hear from them very soon about that. You know, we've got enough time between now and the season start to deal with it. Um, we had toyed with the idea of, of breaking some of the larger groups. Uh, I just saw Stephen had a comment there about um, the under-11s with 25 and whether we break them into three smaller teams. Look, it's, that's possible, but factoring in that we'd have to find another coach, another team manager, another assistant coach, another COVID officer, um, it becomes really difficult. Um, not saying that these things aren't possible, but we still need to know the definite numbers of, of retention before we can make any decisions. Um, you know, it won't be ideal, but we'll come up with a plan that will be, I guess, the, the, the least worst of the, of the plans. Um, you know, if we play a game and you have to have a few on the bench, I'd say we'll have to just deal with it on the day. Um, the 16 aside provision will extend down to lower age groups and across all competitions. So there's a really good chance where we could be having lots of 16 aside games. So we'll know a bit more in the next few weeks once team entries are going in. We'll keep communicating with the league, other clubs, see how they're travelling, and then we'll make a call on whether we need to slice our teams up a little bit smaller. Um, and if you can identify any illnesses as early as possible, sometimes you might know till Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> Let us know. Right, that's enough for me. Um, I'm going to throw it to Kelly and she can uh, run through some of the, the nuts and bolts of, of her side of things from the coaching coordinator's role. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, most of my stuff uh, you'll be pretty familiar with. Um, uh, so it's mostly just for the new coaches, so I won't take too long. Can I move the slides, Matt? Oh, thanks. So just a refresher, lead and assistant coaches, you must have your AFL um, coach level one uh, accreditation all sorted. Um, we've had plenty of time this year, so I'm sure you all have. Um, you're working with children, you check, um, and your code of conduct form signed. Um, this year, you'll also know already that you have to complete the COVID infection control training. So if you didn't do that after last week's meeting, the link will um, be provided again on this slide. Uh, just a reminder about training day requirements. The principles that we outlined at the last meeting um, uh, still stand. So get in, train, get out. Um, use the approved non-contact drills that you got in an email a couple of weeks, uh, sorry, last week that, that came. Um, and you, on training day, you'll need to follow a set of COVID protocols and Kirsten's developed a checklist that we'll provide to you um, to make that a bit easier. Uh, if we get to game day, just a reminder and some news for new coaches that uh, if we play a game, then the coaches have to stay inside the coaches box area, um, adhere to the signed code of conduct. Make sure you've read and understand all the rules. Um, so on the YJFL website, you can download the coach and team managers handbook um, that com contains all the little rules. Um, it's only 2019 up there at the moment. Um, so you'll have to, and I don't know if they'll get to update it, but you'll have to take notice of a few things that have changed, like the minimum number of games and the player numbers, because um, they've changed for this year. Um, but yeah, we're not there yet. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, don't talk to umpires during the game or after. Um, and then follow our Fitzroy cultural framework, which Tim will talk about a bit later. If you haven't got your club gear yet, which you might not have because uh, we didn't end up having practice match day, um, then just contact Peter King, his email address.
address is on the club website. Um, and then ongoing weekly communications, make sure you regularly monitor your email. So make sure if Matt or I send you an email that you respond to that. Um, it really makes it a lot easier if we're not chasing everybody up to make sure you've, you've got your messages. Um, and anything that comes up, even if you think it's small, then just, um, just let us know. Sometimes it's easier to put out small fires. Um, so just a few things to check off, thinking about your list. Is everyone on your list registered? You know, check on those players that maybe haven't come back. Make sure they know that if they're still sitting on the fence, they can't train. Um, it's a good time to, if you haven't already, um, we're, at the end of this, we'll be giving you some training time. So now that you know that it's 20 people in a group and we'll be giving you a date and a time to start training, you can reach out to your players now and find out who maybe isn't going to train because training's optional. It's okay not to train. There's no consequences for not training in this environment. It's, everybody still gets to play if we get, if, if we get there. Um, so do that and then let us know what your group looks like. It's just, you know, if you if you're a, if you're sitting on 21 or 22 players, but you've got a couple that aren't going to train, that really makes it a lot easier for us to manage the grounds if we know you only need one group, uh, one end of the ground, and not both. <clears throat> Vice versa, if you need two, then we just need to know. Um, so the support you'll need, um, a bit different to a normal season, you will need a COVID safety rep. Um, good to have more than one um, because. The coach and team manager, on if it gets to game day, they're going to be busy. So you really need a dedicated safety rep. And then given that if that adult is sick, then they can't come to training and they can't come to the game. So you really do need a backup. Um, obviously, if you haven't got an assistant coach and a team manager, it's time to get cracking. Uh, two trainers is good too for the same reasons that um, someone could be sick and no one wants to be the trainer every week. Uh, you'll need a runner unless you've got under nines or under eights. Um, a reminder, coaches and assistants need level one and everybody who's a team official needs to complete the COVID infection control training and everyone who's a team official needs a working with children's check. Uh, so training is starting soon. Uh, I think Matt gave you the date. I think it's next Sunday. Um, we'll have, we're going to run it like a pre-season. So it'll be Sundays um, with an optional second, that should say session, not season, um, for some older teams if we need them. Uh, no equipment yet, just cones and footies. Uh, a good tip that we got in a meeting from the YJFL the other night was when the kids get to training, make sure they space their water bottles a metre and a half apart rather than throw them all together so that when you stop for a break, they don't have to all jump in close to each other to find their water bottles. Um, so no other additional gear and just the drills that we've approved. If you've, come, if you've got some other drills that you want to use that are non-contact, um, then just let us know and we'll add those into the list. Um, practice in pairs is okay. Uh, you should keep those pairs consistent throughout the night um, rather than change them around. And just to, just to think too about, um, about your training that even though we've got this little bank of approved drills, you still really need to think about um, how you're spacing the kids out, especially if, if there's a line of kids, you might want to break it down and run two drills. Um, or if, you know, if you've got four cones, make sure they're far enough apart that the kids aren't inadvertently standing close to each other. So the drills still need you to, you're really going to have to still have a good look and a think about how you're going to run training. Um, and you'll need a backup plan because you might get sick yourself. So this isn't like, oh, I've got a bit of a sore throat, but I couldn't possibly miss Sunday's match. Well, this year's a bit different. You might not be able to. If you're sick, you shouldn't go. You shouldn't be around people. It's really a whole new world. So think about what you're going to do if you can't coach the team. Um, <clears throat> and then this is just long-term stuff. You've had lots of time. I'm sure you've all established your coaching philosophies and your coaching plans and your training plans because you've had loads of time, unlike a normal season. But um, if you haven't, give some thought to, you know, what do you stand for? What kind of environment do you want to create? And, you know, maybe you had a coaching philosophy and you want to completely change that because this is a whole new thing. Um, you know, kids have been under a lot of stress, um, you know, you don't know what's going on in other people's families. So maybe your coaching philosophy, it might be a bit different to, to what it would have been if we'd already got started. Um, same for 
the training plan, really have a think about your training plan. If we're only training for an hour or a bit more than an hour, just really think about how you're going to effectively deliver really efficient training. Um, think about whether you, if your kid's old enough to have team rules um, and set expectations for players and parents. Um, teamwork, respect, discipline, but also communication. How, how are you going to communicate with people? What if people are unhappy? How can they approach you? Um, and I guess a really big one for this year is the player rotation process because, as Matt's just said, with the smaller number of kids um, allowed for a game to go ahead, you could end up rocking up with your full kid of 24 and only having 12 in the opposition. So make sure you've got a good spreadsheet, someone taking notes so that you're not always rostering the same kids off um, because I can assure you from from my own experience, if if a, um, if a parent thinks a player's being treated unfairly, they will tell you and you'll, you'll be really happy that you've, you've kept really good records. Um, and I guess player allocation um, is probably, uh, probably a mute point because we haven't had time to stream yet, but I think people who've been allocated by a friendship groups, they should be all sorted by now. I think that's it for that one. Um, I just put the team manager one up just for our new coaches so you've got an idea of what your team manager does. They've got a pretty big important role on, um, on game day. Um, so the team manager will be making sure that uh, only the coach, the assistant coach, the runner, the trainer and any bench players are in the, um, in the box. Everybody else has to be on the other side of the ground and that includes the parents. The parents are not only not allowed in the box, but they actually should be on the other side of the ground to where you are. So in, get your team manager and your ground manager to sort that out for you. Um, so on game day, obviously you'll have your team manager and your ground manager. This year you'll have your COVID safety rep as well. Uh, you'll have at least one trainer. Um, no water carriers this year. The kids will be bringing their own water, but you'll still need a goal and a boundary umpire, a scorer, a timekeeper. You'll need someone to monitor the scoreboard if you're playing at BSO or Vic Park, um, because that scoreboard's not next to the timekeeper's desk, um, and people to give BNF votes. Uh, no oranges and snakes this year, so we'll have to make sure the parents know to bring some post-match um, uh, snacks. Um, Bruno's just raised a good point. Yes, the, pay the players do need to be 1.5 metres apart on the bench, um, but I guess when we get to play, who knows if th those rules will, um, will apply, but at the moment, yeah, they do. Um, and so your team manager is also responsible for entering your scores and lodging your team sheets. So that slide's just there to let you know that your team manager is really important. You can't take to the field without them. You need to get yourself a good one if you haven't done that already. Thanks. A um, couple of slides on our resources that are available to you. If you've joined, um, if you've joined Coach AFL, hopefully you've had a good look around there. There's some great resources. If you want to think about what kind of coach you are, it's a really good reading and really good, interesting stuff on that website. Um, next one is our own website. I think we've got a few resources there as well. Um, a few tools and things, uh, a few drills that um, have been uploaded from coaches over the years. Um, and we've also got access to advanced coach mentoring. So all of the coaches who've come back to us, um, who've coached with us before, you'll be, really, um, you'll be really familiar with advanced coach mentoring. Um, and if Matt can give me the next slide. This is a good time for me to introduce Chris Connolly who I'm sure you all know. He's Thank you very much, Kelly. Of coaching. <laughs> He's the I've, director. Uh, <laughs> I've, been, I've been listening from Elliot and some of the coaches are thinking, how did I let Matt talk me into doing this job? Because it looks like being pretty tough. 
But don't worry, we're here to support you and you're going to have a great influence on all your players. And uh, you're real heroes of the society, uh, of the uh, community. And uh, But what uh, this virus has made uh, force coaches to do is be highly organised. And that has been my mantra right from the start with junior coaches because when you're organised, you're going to maximise every minute of training. Uh, players don't train enough. They don't get long enough to work on their skills. One or two training sessions a week at uh, community clubs. So I encourage them to work at home. Um, but you've got to maximise every minute just to develop the players, but to make sure uh, that the brand of the Fitzroy Junior Football Club is highlighted because uh, you are the shop window at training. I mean, you know, in a game, parents don't know who's got the most talent. They, they're not concerned about the scoreboard. But when they're... When their daughter or child, uh, son goes to training, uh, they want a highly organised training session where uh, the players can really benefit from the environment being set up. Now, our program there, Kelly. Um, Matt, will you going to um, bring it? Chris, can um, I just interrupt you for a minute? Yeah, you can. Someone's not on mute and they really need to be because it's really Cam, hard to uh, hear. It's Cam. Cam, can you please, or Cam Home, whoever that is, can you please mute yourself? Will do. Thank you very much. It's Cam's shout, I think. <laughs> I think we've all done that one uh, along the way. Uh, look, Advanced High Performance was set up to help the clubs with their administration through Terry Dillon. We do a kicking program. But this coaching program was designed by Peter Nicholson and I. And I know there's 11 new coaches, but Peter spoke to uh, the coaches in place the last few years. And we were coaching directors at our uh, son's junior clubs. I was East Ringwood and he was Park Orchards. And we just felt it's almost impossible uh, to get all coaches in the one room. Maybe this will be a big innovation, Matt, for every junior footy club that we can get coaches on board for a short amount of time through this Zoom technology. It's fantastic. But our, our program is to assist coaches. It's to support you. It's to help you, um, you know, really organise some great sessions and, and have a great experience yourself. So if we could just flick through, uh, flick through there, Kelly. Uh, this is a, a, an old homepage, the next slide there, Matt. No worries. Um, Switch it over to your live. Well, if you if you can bring up the live homepage, that would be perfect. And I'll go through this in five minutes, and then it's up to each coach to really surf through it because there's quite a lot of information in there to suit uh, all coaches, whether they're experienced or whether coaches are uh, coaching for the first time. So if we can just scroll up a little bit there, the first uh, I'll just go through it uh, down the other way. Um, Okay, the coach support, coach education, that has uh, nearly 100 videos in it, uh, just two to three minute videos on all different sorts of uh, uh, tech, techniques, technology, you know, different uh, aspects of football, if you like, offense, defense, stoppages, uh, all the things around um, football. Uh, for instance, if you go to, off, you go to defense, if you can pull up defense, uh, there's a short video there on, if you just, uh, there'd be, um, coaching against the dominant forward. So how do I go about coaching a dominant forward? What's the strengths and weaknesses of that situation? There's a short video there, uh, and there's also the key points off to the side. Now, this, these videos are a reminder for experienced coaches, or they may be just something new for newer coaches, or they just might get uh, coaches thinking uh, in a different way. My favourite video there is about uh, improving self-esteem, and uh, it was in the slides previous when you were going through, Matt, the... Uh, why, why young players play football, and you spoke about wanting to be a part of the team. So the three key components to improving self-esteem to me are, are making a player feel a part of the team and the club, are developing their skills, and also, which wasn't listed there, but maybe was a bit further down, it depends on how you interpret it, is to have players take responsibilities for their actions. It's not the umpire's fault. It's not the coach playing them in the wrong position. It's not their teammates can't kick the ball straight. You know, they've got to learn to take responsibility for their own actions. So there's a short video there. Uh, when you go through all the different uh, topics there, uh, hopefully it'll be some reminders. It's about three hours of education there. And so if you're waiting in the dentist room or you're, um, or you're uh, just uh, at home and have a spare moment, pull up that. We tried to make sure that these video, uh, this information's on all mobile devices and can be pulled up at any time. So, but if you can go back to the home page, and I'll quickly go through this. There is a lot of information. Uh, structure and system, you don't have to go into it, Matt, but, you know, it, AFL, uh, AFL football is situational. It's stop, start. Where do the players stand? Where do they run when we win the ball? Where do they run when the opposition win the ball? Sometimes 
coaches say, look, I just let the players play. Well, what will happen is all the players will run on top of each other. They don't, won't defend well uh, and they won't move the ball out of that situation very well. So uh, there's a lot of information about stoppages, uh, kick-ins and defending kick-ins there. Uh, the training curriculum is really important and you can probably pull that up, Matt. The training curriculum has 40 training sessions for every age group. So if you pulled up, and, and it's all progressive and it's all, uh, they relate to one another, uh, under 14, you can pull that one up, mate. There'll be 40 training sessions. I'll just go through the structure. This, look, this is our philosophy. It's just there for you to think about. It's uh, any session there. Um, we think the training should be divided into four areas. You need to have high volumes of practice. You need to have high volumes of practice uh, to, to develop the players' skills, but also have their skills that they have at that point in time in tune for the upcoming week's game. Uh, so small groups, uh, lots of touches. Uh, probably, you know what, this is going to sound crazy, but I think coaches are going to have play, uh, teams work in smaller groups uh, and touch the balls a lot, which they should have been doing last year when there was no virus. But um, that's our philosophy anyway. All the drills there. We don't want players learning new drills every session, but we try and make every session different to keep the players on their toes. It goes through all the basic fundamentals there. There's a new feature we've added here. Um, the animation, make sure if you go to the animation, you hit the overview, and then you can surf around uh, on the platform and have a look at the drill from different angles. We did animation for every drill. This is a pretty simple one, the ball skill stuff. But when you move into the decision-making type of drills, there's a lot of players on the field. Uh, it's probably a little bit more beneficial in understanding that, that, that drill. Now, when you go, this is an interesting feature and, and uh, it was Wayne Oswell who pushed this through, is that sometimes coaches who know footy, played footy, can coach footy, but have never taught a player a, a basic skill. So what's the language around that and what's the main reference point? So we put these green boxes uh, related topics here. So hit any one of those and we just go through the basic fundamentals to the skill being used in that drill. So for this one, it's uh, the hand mark. And, you know, hopefully it can give you some language and so, you know, the fundamental uh, points to, to emphasise with your player, uh, you, know, you, you know, to help develop their skill. Um, so if we, uh, if we go back to the, uh, the coaching session, uh, kicking volumes are important, decision making uh, and game play. Now, I know sometimes you've got a, a team that is not really skilled and you think, I'm just going to practice ball handling and kicking until they get it right, and then we'll move into the more decision-making drills. You have a responsibility to really have the players understand the game. So I know you'd like to do more ball skills with the younger groups or if there's players that are new to the game, but you've really got to teach them uh, how the game's played. So you as an under-10 coach mightn't get the benefits in the short term, but you're really sowing the seed that they can, their game can be built upon. So the benefit comes with the under-12, under-13 coach in terms of that player really starting to uh, reach their potential. So all the coaching points are there. Um, the age groups that the drills are in are there. So as I say, we try and have a lot of variety in our drills, but you know, through the age groups, we bring them to the club. So that's our opinion to help you. There's plenty of stuff there to look at. And, uh, and maybe you've just got to really dissect it a bit to make sure with the current environment that the drills suit uh, what's going on. Now, I'll also put some senior stuff in there. Some of the coaches here are going to coach their, um, their son or daughter for the next seven or eight years. But you might have an ambition to one day become a senior coach or follow your son or daughter right through. So, you know, you can look at the more, uh, the more senior training, which tends to have a little bit more conditioning and all that type of thing there. So go back to the home page there, Matt. And all those drills morph into this training drills curriculum. Uh, sorry, training drills library. So if you open that up, all the drills are there. So if you want to look at, um, if you go to ball, you, you might want to look at all the ball skills and you might only want to look at the ball skills for a certain age group. That's showing high just up in the left-hand corner there, uh, just under the ball skills. That's it. Up comes the age group. Hit on the age group. Up will come the drills that are relevant for that age group. Um, but you might type in that search category, ball gathering, in will come all the gathering drills. Look, what, what we try and do is, is, is have the fundamentals here, but you know your players, you know the coaching environment, and you know what works with your group. Now, you still have a responsibility to have variety on your training. We believe if a player comes to training knowing exactly what they're going to do, you're going to lose them in terms of their uh, listening, in terms of their motivation. 
Uh, but you know the drills that really work with your group, so you can always have them in the background that you can bring in. Um, now, the warm-up and cool-down drills are there, dynamic warm-up um, are there to have a look at. Uh, it's important about the warm-up in terms of you want your players to be able to do some extra work at home or in the park when they have some spare time. So they're going to start to kick, particularly a wet, heavy ball, you know, and, and the players are starting to get in that 14, 15-year-old age group. You want, the, you want to teach them some basic dynamic uh, warm-up drills. Injured, injured players, uh, if you just hit on that uh, one just up there, Matt, injured players. Uh, lots of drills. Now, for these ones... These drills can be done in the backyard with mum, dad, brother, sister. If you just pull one of those up, Matt, you might have someone in your team who's a bit sore, they're injured, they can't train for one uh, one uh, reason or another. I'm not sure why that's coming up. Just try it. Okay, so there's a lot of basic drills there. Um, that play, just get plenty of touches. This is obviously for injured players or sore players, but we want to keep them involved in the program. We want to make them feel important. Uh, and they're getting plenty of touches with these drills. So they're drills you can do for uh, one minute and, uh, and, and keep them involved. So with favourites, when you go back to drills, you'll see a favourite category. You hit that and it goes into, the, uh, into your favourites. Now, you don't have to log into these, Matt. I don't want to hold everyone up. But there's, I put this in for coach appointment, uh, the style of coach that you, know, you think your team needs. It. You need to understand the different styles of coaching uh, often we're all a combination of uh, of them all uh, how to go about reviewing a coach i think fitzroy junior footy club do it as anyway as well as anyone that i've experienced and if you just hit on coach development there uh, matt there's a lot of coach development videos then they're about developing leadership and and management look if there's one thing i can say to the coaches at the club uh, kelly is they should focus on one aspect of their coaching and they should try and have a program in place that they develop not just their strength that might be something that, that's a, that they're good at but they want to become great at but they really focus on trying to get better at how they communicate with the players how they develop leadership in the group uh, how they uh, c conduct themselves uh, match day sometimes you know we get some bad decisions and coaches can turn into the exorcist pretty quickly or how they um, how they go about managing their stuff, whatever the case may be, uh, and then have a, a little program in place to, to, to make that happen. So there's lots of little tips there on how to develop your own skills. Now, quickly go back there, Matt. This is a new feature. There's a lot of new features in here that maybe the coaches in previous year mightn't be uh, aware of. Go down to coaching material. The individual skills in the green box that are in the, the uh, training drills are all listed in there. Okay, so all the different skills are in there. So the ball handling skills, all the language around, the different types of marks, all the uh, tackling and shepherding and whatnot, they're all in there. Uh, so you can have a look through that. If you go back uh, again to the homepage there, Matt, um, we will have a look at coaching information. Now, there's a lot to coaching. Now, the coach of, uh, the, say, Damien Hardwick at Richmond, he has a big staff that specialise in these areas. When you're the coach of the junior football club at Fitzroy, you have to be uh, the specialist yourself in all of these different areas. Now, they're, they're not really the, the core to your coaching, but they're important to, to have a feel for, if you like, and could make all the difference, some of this information, to one or two players. These topics, mental skills, recovery, nutrition, hydration, sleep. Sleep being probably the biggest issue with young people these days. Um, you know, getting the right amount of sleep um, and, and some medical stuff. There's a lot of information in here. So you can hit on any of those, Matt. Okay, mental skills. So what we try to do is just give some information here on, say, controlling your emotions on match day. You might have some players that... Um, you know, just kind of, you know, con don't control their anger as well as they should. So they're young and they need to develop some skills in being able to do that. So what we try and do is come up with some tips that you might be able to pass on to those players and some language around those type of, uh, you know, type of topics. Uh, you know, kids get very nervous before games. You get some kids who just can't concentrate. You, know, you get some kids that really suffer some form of anxiety for, what, for whatever the case may be. These are skills, These are this is knowledge that you may work with an individual player that they're going to carry through life. And I think Matt made it pretty clear that you know, we're not about producing AFL footballers, we're about producing good citizens who, 
um, really have great fundamentals of values and behaviors in life. And, and this is some of the things that may help. So they're there for you to read in your time. A lot of information there. Uh, we spoke about coaching rules before, Kelly. There's some information. If you just go back again to the homepage, there's a lot of football admin uh, coaching information, a footy admin there, which involves uh, teach, uh, coach, uh, club rules, team rules. Uh, coaching tips I send out once a week and all the tips are in there. I try and kind of make them relevant for, um, you know, for an AFL game. So we'd look at an AFL game on a Friday night and I'd kind of just talk about a principle in coaching. And, um, and there's some other information, uh, you, you know, in terms of publications. I used to write for a few different uh, magazines and all the, all the articles are in there. So it's really up to yourself. It's a resource that has all the information in the one area. Uh, it's there to be used by the club as they see fit, but it's really there to support the coach, support the coach, not tell the coach how to coach, uh, to really support them in the way they go about their business. At the end of the day, and I'll finish up, Matt, uh, by saying, uh, well, three things. You've just put up a third thing. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, at the end of the day, you're the coach and you'll make the decision um, because you know the players the best and you know the environment the best and you know what you'd previously had said to them, which is going to affect how you approach them now. So you'll make mistakes, uh, but we learn from our mistakes. Uh, that's where we learn the most. And don't worry, every AFL coach starting this weekend, uh, they'll make a few blues. Uh, but hopefully they won't make them again next time. So that's all part of the process. Uh, the players are going to learn and develop, um, but you need to be able to show that you can do that too. Because often with coaching, it's not about the drills and the footy side I find is the easiest bit. It's more about the personal approach and connection with the player. And, uh, and that takes a, a fair bit of practice. And that's where you can have the, be the biggest influence. So even when you're highly organised with your training sessions, you're setting it up, showing you're organised, getting an efficient training session, you're showing the player the importance of that uh, being able to manage that situation without anything being said. So the way you behave is going to have an incredible influence on these young players. We, we have a training app for players at home. Often... Uh, parents want to help their players, don't really know what to do. Uh, players, we encourage to touch the footy as much as they possibly can. And there's a lot of drills in here and a lot of uh, information. Um, and, and at the moment, training sessions at home to really uh, help help players develop their skills and understanding of the game. So some of the knowledge in the Advanced Coach Mentoring Program you've just seen is in there. Uh, but there's a lot of other information in there specific to players. When players start to play, we'll put some more features in there so they can analyse how they prepare and how they recover. People have said to me, are you going to put in there and let players analyse their performance? That's not our business. That's the business of the coach. The coach will be the one that will give feedback on performance, uh, no one else. Uh, but what we can do is help them understand the importance of preparation and in, understand the importance of recovery. So, look, there's a lot going on in the short term. Uh, now that we have this Zoom set up, Matt, it wouldn't be on the realms now that um, maybe we have a coaching night and we go through, for those who are interested, particularly the newer coaches, we might come up with three or four topics and, and dig into them and, um, and, and help. We're here to help you. You guys are heroes of the community. You're going to have a huge influence on these young people. Uh, good luck. And, uh, and when you're driving home and you're thinking, you know, I'm not sure... I'm up to this. Uh, that's when you really learn the most because you really analyse and, um, you know, at, at the end of it all, um, it's going to be a great experience for you all. Can I finish with one thing, Kelly? One last word. Sure. Go for it. Okay. Now, your partner is going to be saying at some st stage in the middle of the season, look, you love football more than me. What you've got to say is, but I love you more than cricket, tennis, basketball, table tennis, uh, all those other sports. <laughs> That's funny. That's it. Chris, we've got, um, got some good feedback on the chat group. So some of our stalwart coaches are giving you a good plug there and talking about how good your resource is. Oh, good. Um, but I've just got a question. We've got a couple of new coaches. I don't think they've got their login details yet. So do you know yeah, how to get Yeah, that? well, get, get those to Matt. Matt will flick them off to Purdy Nicholson or I and uh, we'll get them hooked up as soon as possible. If there's any uh, issues or questions, uh, in the feature there, I didn't go through them all, but you can send a message to us and we'll get back to you. 
if you are a child this uh, app here too and if you're interested it's ten dollars it costs ten dollars for a family um so that's something to think about fantastic thank you awesome chris thank you very much really really appreciate your time tonight and also you know just thinking back a couple of years ago chris presented this to me and um my head just about fell off and i started digging into it and realized how much information was in there but absolutely relevant for for us and you know an old junior sport really but um we started developing our own program but this had packaged it all up and you know we we invest in this it's a, a tool that we we want our coaches to utilize um we can get reports out of um out of the guys and peter can send me a, a little sheet that says who's using it and who's not using it and i think one of our guys a couple of years ago i think he had the world record of about four and a half thousand hits into the site i think he looked at every single link and every single video so got great value out of it um the app is a new new feature we've had a bit of a muck around and test with that and it looks really cool as chris said um you know that's something that teams can look at themselves or players themselves can look at i think that's one thing that we can then start to have a muck around with so if you're keen have a try the, the free trial and we can we can talk about that later on but um very very important that you start to get access to that tool and if you find other drills that are useful, um, please send through to Kelly and we can add them to our bank as well. But once you've got access to this, pretty much everything you'll need is in there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel for new coaches. This will, this will be your best friend. Rightio, next up, um, very, very serious part of the evening. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, conduct. Um, something we have to obviously be very conscious of. Um, is how how we behave on and off the field and the the things that we do really influence the players but also um, the spectators outside of the fence can have um, a large impact on the way that your day goes as well so uh, I'll just get Tim McHugh to jump on and he can talk us through the cultural framework and a little piece about conduct. Thank you Matt. Oh there's been a lot of uh information in that last little piece. And I hope um, that we can all just concentrate for the next little bit, because this is the really important bit of this session, particularly what Kirsten is going to outline after uh, my talk. And I'm gonna talk the truth here. We're planning for a best case scenario at the moment, which is, just to get back to training. If we can do that, that's a great outcome. To think that we're going to get on the field and play games without doing a lot of hard work before then is not the truth. Our number one priority as a club is to get kids to come back next season. We've got to make this fun. So my very simple message, and I want everyone to understand and hear this, is that if we don't do the right thing and we take the piss and we act like a dickhead, that's the end of our season. Okay, there are a lot of protocols we need to enact that we can't bend the rules on in terms of uh, managing our way through this COVID piece. Uh, and if you think that we can't do it properly, think again. We have to be serious about this and we have to be truthful. If we don't do it right, you're personally liable for a fine of $1,600 and the club's personally liable for a fine of over $9,500 if we don't abide by the protocols that Kirsten and uh, the team are about to present to you. It's real and that's what we need to really get our head around. Our first step is to get back to training. We've got to do it properly and never before has a season hinged so uh, closely on the values of this club, which are teamwork, 
respect mentoring. Um, and we're going to break this down into bite sized bits. Let's just get back to training first. If we do that properly, we do it how we're supposed to do it and set out amongst the protocols, we'll be successful. Then we'll think about the next step of getting back out on the ground and hopefully having a lot of fun for the rest of the season. But I can't be more truthful to the group about that. And the message is simple. Your conduct matters. We need you not to take lip service about the protocols in particular to the COVID um, uh, uh, policies and, and, and things that we've got to do. And if we do this well, well, we might have a season. If we don't, we won't. And it's that simple. Um, I can go through the rest of the piece about signing our code of conduct forms and all the rest of it. That goes hand in hand with all of this. But um, at the end of the day, we are where we are in this new world and we need to move forward with our primary goal, which is to get kids back on the park playing footy and more importantly, coming back next year. So anything we can do to make that happen, it's in our hands. So I'm gonna hand over um, to uh, Kirsten now, but um, I will say that our cultural framework and our player code of conduct and your um, uh, living what's in those is, is never been more important to this club, never been more important to getting junior football uh, back up and running. So I can't thank you enough for putting your hand up to do this uh, very difficult role. Uh, and I really do encourage you, if there's a piece of this uh, presentation that you're going to listen to, right here, right now, with what Kirsten's going to outline for you, is perhaps the most logistically important piece of this whole presentation tonight. And at the end of this, we've got to remember it's all about the teamwork, the respect and the mentoring. And as I said, if we don't do it properly, we won't get there. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Timbo. Um, we won't delve too deeply into the, the cards and all that kind of stuff. It's in the pack when you get a chance, have a read of it. Um, you know, a long way down the track and hopefully something you'll never need to know about, but it's all in there if you ever need to read it. So can I please invite Kirsten to uh, pop your mic on and um, jump on. Thanks, Tim and Maddie. Um, yeah, if you can move to the next slide, Maddie. Uh, we're, I'm lucky that I'm well supported by the subcommittee as well as the committee. So we're, we're meeting daily and weekly with the, the committee. Uh, one of the things that we're working on uh, is to really detail out, flesh out the protocols. And to make that easier, we're putting together a, a checklist which breaks down detail by detail from before the session um, to during to after and everyone's responsibility in between. So that there will not be hopefully the ambiguity on who's doing what. Um, this checklist is really for the COVID officers to work with the coach. Um, so things like knowing that the COVID safety rep will be the one who will be responsible for marking in the attendance and checking the, each player, like the questions such as, do you have any signs of symptoms of a cold cough or a sore throat? And really breaking out into that minute detail so that it's, it's crystal clear. So all the coaches steps are outlined in the training checklist. Everything from wiping down your footies and cones to making sure the exclusion zones are marked out before the sessions to making sure that, you know, the coaches don't say um, arrive any earlier than 10 minutes prior to the sessions and then the other players should arrive um, no earlier than five minutes prior to the session so that we don't have crossover. This is all drafted at the moment, but we're trying to break it down 
so that there isn't chaos on the day. Um, we're seeing people returning to training and we're seeing good things. We've probably been slower than certain clubs, but we certainly are taking it serious and want to have a very considered, measured approach. Um, next slide, please, Maddie. Last Thursday in the coaches session, we obviously went through a lot of the protocols. The key one that has changed was around allowing of um, up to 20 players per half of the ground. Um, but there were many questions that were great that were raised. As we mentioned on the night, that we won't be making up um, the answers for the many great questions that were asked from the group. So what we'll be doing is collating all the um, frequently asked questions and distributing to the community. Um, but they already exist, but it's a little bit piecemeal at the moment. So we've got some on the YJFL Football League site and we're using some from the AFL Victoria. Ideally, we'd like a single source, um, but what we're doing is we're just collating into all one spot and hopefully we'll put some more pressure on the YJFL um, because some of the questions such as, you know, what happens um, if there is an injury at training, we haven't got a clear guideline, um, but we have been liaising um, with YJFL and there is some common sense that we can take in the meantime. So things like, you know, contacting the parents and getting them involved if possible if the child is injured, uh, using hand sanitizer before and after the treatment and minimising contact um, if, you, um, if it is a serious injury. So yeah, using hand sanitizer, we're potentially looking at gloves. Um, so we're looking at stocking up our first aid kits. Um, but we're gonna really break that level of detail and have that support in a clipboard and a sort of a kit for the COVID uh, officer. Um, so there's certainly a lot still to be done um, in preparation for next Sunday. One of the other big steps we're doing is next Tuesday, having a, a webinar for all members. Um, so we'll have a recording and we'll be doing some more comms. Uh, and in addition to the code of conduct, we'll have an addendum outlining all the um, COVID safety rules, protocols, sort of at a digestible um, Latin language. And we'll be getting parents and players to read both the code of conduct and the COVID rules and sort of signing off um, and agreeing to adhere to those rules prior to returning to training. But we're gonna have some more comms coming out tomorrow around that. Um, next slide, Maddie, please. We're gonna just briefly touch on concussion management because obviously we're not going into any physical contact. Um, but because we have new, some coaches, new coaches in the crowd, I uh, just wanted to just highlight over the last three years, we've sort of averaged around 80, 18 to 20, and it's dropped in 2019 to 14 head injuries, concussions. Um, so it is on the decrease. However, in the girls, um, if you look at the red section, that's the girls, um, there has been sort of a slight increase in concussions for the girls. Um, so I, I know we had some sort of education sessions just before COVID, um, but the main points here, are really that all trainers and team managers will have a concussion recognition, recognition tool to help with assessing the condition at the time of injury. Um, we'll have a, it's hard to talk about this now because it's, I can't, I'm look, looking at return to train, but in the future, hopefully when we can return to play, we'll have YJFL supplied cobramedics at the grounds you know, to support our trainers. The key message really is, um, really it's the trainer's um, advice. They have the final say in concussion. So even if you want, you think a player is able to play on, it's really the trainer that will sort of cease that player from continuing. Um, the other one is returning to play that they obviously need clearance from their medical doctor before they can return to train or play. Next slide. We'll be we'll be talking again about this in the event that we do return to play. Okay. At the moment, none of our, our trainers 
first aid training was cancelled. Coincident it time was at the same time as the um, COVID. So um, that's something we need to look at implementing. But at the moment, there's no face-to-face -face contact. So um, we are unsure when that's going to happen. Your next slide, please, Maddie. And the final point I'm going to touch on is around creating a self safe culture. Um, there has been a lot of increases in behavioural guidelines this year provided, and we've had to revisit our policy. Um, I'm not going to go point by point through this slide. However, the main thing that's really applicable, well, it's all applicable, but something that everyone can do as a coach is just to really be mindful of their use of language and, and their communication. Uh, there's potentially a lot of anxious kids in the group. So if there is an aggressive tone in a coach's voice, they, their nervous systems can quickly get upregulated. Um, so just, just be very wary of your tone of voice and language that you'd used with our kids because we are certainly as adults and even more so as coaches in a position of power. And it's important that we don't abuse that in any way. The other key thing is where to go for support. Um, we're so lucky to have John as our child safety officer. His contact details are on the website under the committee tab. Um, there's also, you can, anyone can email me at safety at Fitzroy. I can't even remember my email address, footballfc.com. Um, and obviously, children can always turn to coaches, but there is a responsibility um, for you not to, to solve the problem, but to actually report on it um, and get support because um, we take it pretty seriously. Um, but anyway, yeah, it can make a big difference if you um, are really open, respectful, inclusive and to our kids. So um, good luck there. And next, is that on to you, Maddie? That's me. Um, thank you so much. Cool. Um, the, the role that you've taken on is a, is a humongous one. Um, and we couldn't uh, entertain getting back to training without having you on board. So much appreciated all the things that you're doing. Um, this is the home stretch. We're nearly there. I'll have a quick yarn about the grounds facilities, um, why and where we play, just so that everyone's aware of it. Obviously quite a few newies on board and we want to make sure that um, we're all understanding of why we play where we do. If you've been out and about, which I'm sure most of you have, you'll see that the grounds are in absolutely pristine condition. I've never seen our grounds in as good a condition as they are currently. Um, take my little poochie out for a walk pretty often and we do the little circuit around all the grounds. Um, if you can fight your way through the, the dog traffic um, on all the grounds, and I'm probably one of them as well, you'll discover that um, there's probably a dog poo around and uh, when you get out in training, you have to make sure you clear that out, but also, we will potentially face um, a bit of a challenge where the neighbourhood who live around each of the grounds have discovered how good the grounds are and have taken it on themselves to um, use those spaces more than they probably ever have. So we need to be very conscious of that. We've got a fantastic relationship with our council. We know that we're just tenants of those grounds. We don't own them and we need to really be aware that people have become very used to using those spaces at the times that we would normally be playing football and training. So if you get to training and you encounter somebody who's quite persistent in taking a um, little Fido for a walk, please don't worry too much about it. Let um, your COVID uh, rep or one of the um, other committee members who will probably, probably be at the ground know and they can help uh, deal with some of those things. The council's providing us with some signage. I think that's started to go up now. Um, having goals. Sorry, sorry, Matt. Yes, Maddie. Maddie. Sorry, Matt. Can you? Uh, you just broke up really badly across the feed. Then can you just start that bit about it back at Fido? Okay. So if you're on a ground and you've got a training session going, and somebody's walking across the ground with their dog, or there's a few people who 
seem reluctant to shift, um, please don't engage with them. Just make sure that your COVID rep and um, potentially a committee member who will be at most of the, the training sessions know and they can help deal with some of those situations. We don't want to see any conflict. Um, we're sharing the grounds. People will take a little bit of time to change their behaviours. Um, signage is getting installed. I think there's a few signs going up around grounds now. Um, and also with the goals being installed, that's a really good indicator to the community that um, footy is, is back on the horizon. And um, if we have an organised training session and it's booked, we've got all rights to be there, but we can't really force other people to get off. So a pleasant conversation generally gets those things sorted out. Um, I'll run through our grounds. Now, we're very, very lucky. Some clubs have only got one ground and how they're managing, I don't really know. Um, we've got uh, currently six grounds in play. So anything from the, the larger size grounds, uh, Brunswick Street Oval and Victoria Park, down to Ramsden Street, stepping down through the sizes of the grounds to Olney Oval, Alfred Crescent, and then now our new little baby ground of Cox Oval. Um, what I haven't included in there is for our under eights this season, they're going to be running with um, a grid arrangement across Brunswick Strait Oval. So pretty much like a little mini Auskick game on, Oz, uh, on Brunswick Street Oval, two games will be running simultaneously. So we've got ground sizes to cater for every single age group and level of ability at our club. Um, during your journey of your time through the club, you'll pass through all of these grounds. So at some point in time, if you're brand new, you'll start on the smallest ground, move up through from Cox Oval to Alfred, onto Olney Oval at Yarra Bend, uh, then through to Ramsden Street, and then the, the senior guys and girls will be playing on Victoria Park and Bundrick Street Oval. So depending on when you start your journey, you might have started on, um, for example, uh, Olney Oval at Yarra Bend. Um, Yarra Bend's had a bit of a bad rep for a while. Um, go for a walk up there and have a look and you'll see it's actually a fantastic place. Um, the good thing for us is that we've got it. Um, the bad thing is the facilities aren't amazing, but we're working on it. We're making some really good headway and getting some really fantastic traction through uh, the levels of government required to get some development happening down there. It's going to be a long game, um, but we're putting all the, all the steps in place so that in the future, not only this club, but other clubs in the area, so the senior football club and the cricket clubs, will have access to amazing facilities. Um, you might see that the survey has also revealed that um, support for Yarra Bend has increased dramatically because we've actually informed our members. We've told them what it's all about. We do our pre-season training up there. And in this particular phase, we're going to treat it exactly like a normal pre-season. So the focus will be on a Sunday um, we're going to spread around our grounds. The difference is that we've actually got access to our normal grounds as well. But we also have to be very conscious of the time that we're on the grounds. And I'll show you the training grid that we're going to go with uh, in a moment. But um, it is pretty tight. Stick to your time frames and there'll be no problems. As Kelly mentioned before, get in, train, get out. Don't hang around. Encourage members to just drop their kids, go for a walk somewhere else. You know, just keep keep clear of the spaces. And if we all get along, this will go smoothly and then we can actually get back to playing. If people disregard the rules and decide that training is going to go for another 20 minutes, it's not going to work and you'll be hearing from me. So please make sure I don't have to ring anyone and tell them that you're, uh, you've gone over time and you've disrupted another, you know, two groups of kids training. Um, so geographically, you can see that Yarra Bend is really, really close to our other grounds. It's right near yeah, um, Ramsden Street and Victoria Park. Beautiful spot, a little bit harder to get to via public transport. So we don't generally schedule midweek training up there. It's a bit hard for kids to get there from school, but for Sundays, it's absolutely perfect. Um, and we're definitely gonna make the most of it. There's our next slide, let me just jump onto that. Here is our training grid. Um, it is pretty tight, but Everyone has got a slot. We've got plenty of time to work with across the Sunday. Um, last piece of the puzzle before we communicate this out to our families is I've got to get it signed off by the council. 
So please, if you are going to send a message to your families, don't include the time for your training until I can let you know directly. But uh, Ben's going to be sending a message out to all members tomorrow with a bunch of information, including the return to training date. And then once we've confirmed these dates, which I expect will happen uh, probably early next week, we can then let you all know training's on, um, you're ready to go, providing that you guys can give us a COVID rep per team and you've got your team list sorted out and you've got your assistant coaches and team managers ready to go. So until those boxes are checked, you can't train. Yeah, and I think it's important also, Matt, to sort of say at this point, is that the committee will be sending um, people around to various training uh, sessions, etc., just to ensure that um, the policy set out by uh, Kirsten and, and the rest of the committee members that have developed uh, this piece are being adhered to. Um, because if we don't adhere to them, we're not covered by our insurance. If we're not covered by our insurance, well, we're hanging out by ourselves uh, on all of this. So again, I can't stress enough, don't take the piss, don't pay it lip service, do the right thing. Teamwork, respect, mentoring. Thanks, Timmy. Um, this is, is pretty much what you've seen before. We sent this around early in the season. This is what we're hoping to get back to in about four weeks time, all going into plan. Um, so while the Sunday sessions are on at the moment and we've got plenty of time to move, it will condense quite a lot when we come back into playing time. So this is going to be the plan moving forward. Um, I know there's been one or two coaches who have had a little bit of an issue occasionally with um, work commitments and clashes of times and things. But to be honest, we really don't have a lot of time to move on this. We are so cramped in our schedule. We get an allocation. We've extended that with a council and every single spare minute we have, we use. So it's all about the cooperation. Um, we all have to fit in. And if we can do that, we have no dramas. Um, look, last little thing, and that's just a quick one we'll flip over, but we've got tons of equipment. Um, we don't generally get it a lot of it out in circulation because people just forget about it. But we've got tons of stuff in storerooms around the grounds. We've got the bump bags and all the bits and pieces. We've got um, ground mats where the younger age kids can get a feel for positions on the ground. Um, we've got a few new boxing sets floating around. There's tons of those little um, agility ladders and poles and bits and pieces as well. So when we get to the point where we can have equipment, please let us know what you need and we can get it out to you. Generally, it will be kept at the locations. Now for keys this year, rather than having loading keys where one or two sets of keys would be handed around between a couple of teams and shared. We've actually got um, combination key safes you know, going to be installed at each of the grounds. There's an app you get for your phone. We give you access. You get access on the game day and also training nights for yourself. And you just do your fingerprint and you walk up to the thing with Bluetooth and the key box opens and the keys in there. So it should um, take away the problems we've had previously with keys going missing, people not knowing where the keys are and how to find them. So that's a great initiative we've got in place. Um, we're very close to having those installed. There'll be some differences at the rooms when we get access to the rooms as far as sanitization. There's going to be um, uh, hand sanitizer pumps near taps and doors so that everyone that comes and goes can, can do all the right things. Um, we don't know what the rules are gonna be yet. So when that happens, we'll tell you guys straight away Thank you very much for your time this evening. I'm happy to throw to some questions, but I think this might be the world record fastest ever coaches presentation. So thank you very much. Any questions, please either send them through to Kelly or you can just turn your mics on now and, and fire them out and we can try to answer them for you tonight. Oh, I've got one, Matt, from, uh, oh, I can't remember who asked it now, but, oh, James, if, um, if he's got enough numbers, can registered siblings join in in a training session if, if you still stay under the 20? As in a younger player training with an older player? Uh, James might jump in and tell me whether it's that or the other way around. I'm not sure.
happy to take that offline potentially if, if you want to discuss that later, James. We can talk about that later on. But I'd generally say if we can try and keep them to their own age groups, just to really minimise that cross contamination. Um, we want to try and keep the pairs throughout the training session consistent. It's going to be a lot easier for the teams in the non-streamed ages who have got less than 20 because you can then turn up on the night with a pre-filled in team sheet. All you have to do is check off the kids as they arrive. They've got to sign themselves in. Um, yep. If it's an older group and it hasn't been a streamed uh, set up yet and you might be still working with squads, a little bit more complicated. We're having some breakout sessions with some of those groups uh, a bit later on. So if your age group would like to get together and have a, have a chat to us about your own unique scenario, for example, under 10s or 11s or 12s, very, very happy to coordinate that for you. Um, we're getting together on the weekend with the under 15s and Colts boys. Uh, the 14s and up girls are going to get together next week and have a chat about some stuff which is common to, to their requirements. Um, any other age groups that would like to do a session, please just book it in with us and we can we can jump online. Yeah. And get a um, Matt, I think the really threshold issue for all of us to understand here is we've got to keep it simple. We've got to keep it within the policies that we've got. Don't be inventive about things um, because the moment that we step outside of that, is the moment that we put ourselves uh, in an awkward position. If we don't have volunteers who are going to take on the COVID officer roles, take on the additional coaching roles with the split groups, etc., training can't happen. Game day can't happen. So we need to be organised um, and, and very astute and sensible about how we move forward. That's the simple message. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And look, it's obviously not going to suit everyone. Um, some people might find that it's just not for them or they can't do a Sunday because they have family commitments or whatever it might be. That's okay. People don't have to train. We're offering it. Um, you know, like Tim said, we've got to fit within the guidelines. There is no wavering. We can't have 21. There's no way you can have 21 on the ground because if we get caught out doing that, then the club is in some serious trouble. Any more questions on that sheet there, Kelly? No. Nothing else? Well, uh, no, I think um, everyone's pretty quiet. Everyone might be a bit overwhelmed. They might be asleep. Who knows? I can see a few smiley faces. The good news is we've got this recorded and you can all come back and watch it again tomorrow and catch up on the weekend and watch it all again. Um, Another question I just saw left pop in then, Kelly. Uh, Scotty's got one. With two training groups, yes, both teams need a coach. And it, well, you don't need a coach and an assistant as long as you don't go over the 20 in each group. The, the AFL says you need a reasonable number, uh, whatever number is reasonable to coach. But I think if you go more than two is probably not necessary. Doesn't mean you have to have two. If you've got two coaches per group of 20, one per 10, that's a really great ratio. It's pretty tough doing 20 on your own, um, especially without a whistle. So we can't use whistles. Um, so have a think about how that's going to work for you. You're working with half a ground, 20 kids out doing things. So another pair of hands is really handy. If, if they're an official assistant coach, that's ideal. If they're not, it'd be fantastic if they could watch this Prezo and, and read the PowerPoint just to make sure they're across what we're, what we're trying to convey because um, quite a few of the parents have got slightly different ideas about coaching um, and then putting into practice is a little bit more difficult. Um, but, yeah, if we can ensure that the people who are going to be helping us, um, you know, are somebody that you know and trust and can help you. If you haven't got enough assistance, um, please let us know who those people are and we can, we can just make sure they're okay. I just, I think it's worth just reminding people that uh, the COVID officer and the coach don't count in the 20. It's 20 kids. It's 20 players. Um, so your COVID officer and your coaches are additional to the 20. Someone's just asked that. Good question. Kelly, but one addition to that, though, is if we have any parents or carers that congregate near the ground, then they're counted as part of that 20. 
Good point. That's, That's why point. you're the safety officer. No. Um, <laughs> no, no, but it wasn't saying that you answered no. correctly, but there is one sort of addition yeah. to yeah, that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it comes, it comes back to the point that we're trying to stress on everyone, which is there is no room to pay lip service to it. If you don't think that um, someone down the road's not going to dob us in, they will. Victoria's already issued $8 million worth of COVID restriction breach fines. They will. Um, so please, very much, we can't be more serious about this and what your duty of care is. Um, and more honest about it, you can't pay lip service to it. Um, parents can't hang around. Um, it is what it is. We've got to live with it. Our role is to get people back on the ground and, and, and playing the brilliant game that we're all interested in. And that's our number one focus. And, 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 and again, I can't thank you all enough for wanting to be a part of that. It's going to be hard work for us all, but it's just what we've got to do. Rightio, on that note, Tim, I think we might call it a night. Um, if we've missed any questions, we can get a transcript after this session's finished and we can respond to you directly. Um, we'll be posting this online and sharing the link to the video and also the, the soft copy and all of the associated links to our resources, um, the COVID training, etc., will be on there as well. Um, Ben's gonna be sending the email to the club tomorrow. So once that's hit inboxes, then I think it's an appropriate time for you to then reach out to your, your teams. If you haven't got your team list yet, talk to Kelly and she can then shoot that across to you. I think pretty much everyone now should have that information. Um, there is still a couple of teams that haven't got coaches and hopefully you're on this call tonight. Um, under 13s, we need a couple and under 14s, we're looking for somebody as well. Um, so in that area, please let us know if you're interested in putting your hand up. Um, the, the level is going to be significantly lower this year across the board. Expectations are lower. As long as we make sure our behaviours are high and the kids are having fun, uh, I think the the delivery of what we're trying to do is is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, we've given you all the tools and and thank you all for jumping on the, on this call tonight. Much appreciated. And as always, if you've got any questions, let us know and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matty. Thanks, Great job, everyone. mate. Thanks, everybody. Great job.